Please be seated. I have a colleague, uh, another Episcopal priest, who chooses his vestry, which is what we call governing board, in case you don't speak Episcopalian, by drawing names out of a hat. I kid you not, right? That's what they do at their annual meetings. We, you know, we like to have a nice civilized election. But instead, this colleague of mine uh, draws names out of a hat. I assume it's not the names of everybody who's eligible to the vestry, you know? I assume it's the people who actually agreed that they would be willing to be on the vestry, because that would cause a whole other set of problems. But he just puts all the names in and draws them out until they have enough people to serve on the vestry. And I understand how that seems ludicrous, but there's also a pretty strong biblical foundation for it, if you heard today's first lesson. I mean, that's how Matthias became one of the 12 apostles, which is a much you know, bigger deal probably than being on St. Stephen's vestry. No offense to all of my wonderful vestry members. Plus, there's some appeal to it, right? Because it just makes things simpler, you know? Instead of having bios in the newsletter and election ballots to count and all of that, you just trust that we pray to God and assume that God will have some hand in this drawing out of hats. Trust that God will give us the leadership that we are praying for. Although I have to say, I always think in this story about what it must have felt like to be the other guy, right? Uh, what is it? Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. You know, they spend all that time telling his name. You think he's going to be the one who wins the draw, right? He's not the character you expect to be killed off in this episode. But as it turns out, he wasn't the name that was chosen. And it was only those two, actually. That they said there were 120 people in the room. So what about the other 118? I mean, I guess technically 11 of them were already apostles. So what is that, 107? Nevertheless, right? <laughs> I wonder how they wondered. No math in this sermon, right? But so how they all felt, you know, to have not been chosen. I wonder if they were relieved <laughs> or if they were disappointed or if they were confused. The disciples prayed, you know what is good, God, right? You know what is right. And apparently it wasn't justice, <laughs> poor guy. In the gospel today, we hear a part of Jesus' farewell address. In the gospel of John, it takes, I think, three or four chapters. And I get it. I mean, he's had this beautiful ministry, and he knows it's going to come to a violent end, and there's so much he wants to say, I'm sure, to the people he loved on this earth. But in this part, he's not addressing them. He's addressing God on their behalf. This is a prayer. Jesus' final prayer for his followers, for us. And he takes a long time getting there, doesn't he? <laughs> it reminds me of when clergy pray together. Don't ever have to go to one of those things. My God. It's like, yes, we're all good at praying. Just get to the point. <laughs> we know, Jesus, we know. You, you've done great work. You're amazing. We love you. We're following you. What's the point of this prayer? Because it's interesting when you look at that long speech, what actually did Jesus ask, right? He asked that we would be sanctified in the truth, right? In, in God's word, which in plain English, I think means made a holy people by what Jesus has taught us about who God is. And then he says, protect them in my name. Protect them in my name, that they would be one as you and I are one, God that we would all be one. Now that's a tall order, isn't it? I know I have told you before that long before uh, the Mother's Day became what it is now, uh, Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, that's how we might know her, also wrote a Mother's Day declaration. This was kind of post-Civil War time. And instead of calling for flowers and handmade crafts, although those are beautiful and we love them as mothers, she called for peace. Disarmament, actually, was the exact word she used. She said, no matter who you are, this war is hurting you, right? That's the problem with war, isn't it? No one wins war. I know we think we do, but we, there's always a loss. And she said, we're losing our men, right? We're losing our sons and our brothers and our fathers, because at this time women didn't serve in the military. 
And they've all left their work, their plows, is how she puts it, to go serve in these wars. So let's leave our work, which let's face it, she was probably not being paid to do at that point. Let's women all leave our work and come together to make a council for international peace. International peace. And she actually did this in her lifetime. She would gather people, every, women, every year to try to talk about how we could make a move towards peace. How we could uh, soften the loss of, of so much that comes from war. Which is not to say that we don't honor the people who serve our country. Of course we do. But we know there's a loss there. And what do we do to make peace in the face of war? And I, I don't know that she even lived to see Mother's Day become a national holiday, to sort of be translated into what it was. But I, I always remember her on this day. Because I know that Mother's Day is complicated. I probably also say that every year, right? I mean, it seems like a great, simple idea. We love our mothers. Let's take them out to brunch. Great. <laughs> Don't go out to brunch today. It's really not a good idea. <laughs> no, you can do it if you want to. But the, the point is, Motherhood's a little more complicated than that, right? Uh, some of us don't really get along with our mothers. Some of us have lost our mothers. Some people wanted to be mothers, but they couldn't be. Some people never wanted to be mothers, and they don't understand why we're making such a big deal out of it, like you can't be a full, complete woman if you haven't ever been a mother. There's a, mothers that we mourn, and there's mothers who mourn their own children. There are strained relationships. So Mother's Day brings up a lot of things for us that aren't just how great it is to go out with our mother for brunch. But when I look at the bulletin that we have today and all these names of people that people in this congregation wanted to honor, I realize that in Mother's Day there's also a great deal of love. Love for our biological mothers and our non-biological mothers, love for all the women who have shaped us. And I think that when Julia Ward Howe wrote her Mother's Day proclamation all that 150 years ago, that she knew a little bit about what Jesus was trying to talk about in today's gospel. She knew a little bit about what it is to say, we all have more in common than we have that divides us. And we all want peace. And we all love people. And we all want to build a world where that love and peace and joy are the dominant values, are experienced by all people. And this... This image of peace is portrayed in this picture. I, I found it because I was easier to describe it. That George Tooker made. It's called the Embrace of Peace. Uh, do you recognize this picture? This is us. Did you know that? This is a picture of the passing of the peace. Ours looks a little different, right? But this is his image of the passing of the peace. That little part we do in the middle of the service where we shake hands with our neighbors or give each other a hug. Because for Tooker, that moment is a glimpse of the kingdom of God, right? Of that moment when we'll all be gathered together, every tribe and language and nation and people, and, and when we're gathered around the throne after we have died, but also not just of heaven, but of now, right? Of what it means for us to try to be working for a world where we all know that we are one. And this small gesture, right? Shaking hands, maybe giving a hug even if it seems simple, is actually a profound act. Because we're saying, no matter who you are, no matter where you came from, no matter what kind of a mood you are in this morning, no matter what your plans are for after church, we wish you Christ's peace. We wish you Christ's peace. And when Julia Ward Howe wrote the Mother's Day proclamation that she did, she wanted that too. Not just for us to pass the peace or to proclaim the peace, but to live with peace to live as people of peace. So I guess the only thing to do is to make all the decisions that we make as a church from now on by drawing names out of a hat. You don't, you don't, you don't want to do that? <laughs> I know, it seems strange. And imagine the people who don't come to church, what they would think of us if that's how we made all of our decisions. They're already wondering why we're here instead of going out to brunch on Mother's Day. So then they find out we're making decisions by drawing names or rolling dice or whatever, and we're going to have a lot of problems. And yet... I do think that that is part of what Jesus was asking us to do in today's gospel. Not draw the names or roll dice, but to pray, right? To ground our decision-making in God. Because as strange as it is, we actually believe 
that when we are gathered together in Christ's name, when we ask things of God, something happens, right? That something transforms us, something is changed by being a community of people gathered together trying to follow Christ. We believe that when we ask God for what we might do next, we ask God to guide us, that God guides us. Maybe not in the direction we had hoped for, maybe not quite in the time frame we had wanted, but that God gives us answers. We believe that when we pray to God for healing or transformation or sustenance or, or peace, that God works in our lives to make those things happen. And that doesn't mean we don't have our own work to do. Of course we do. But something spectacular and transformative happens when a community gathers together in Christ's name. I have heard it said that there are only three answers to prayer that God gives. Have you heard this? Yes. We all like that name, that answer. Um, Not now. And I have a better idea. Right? Now, I don't know what Justice or any of the other people, what did we say it was, 107? In that, in that first story, would have thought if that's what I had told them, oh, God has a better plan. Because in those moments, you think, that can't be, that just sounds like silliness. But I know it to be true. Because I've experienced that in my own life. When things don't go the way I had planned for them to go, sometimes they go in a way that is better than anything I could have asked for or imagined. I've always wanted to be a mother. I know how silly and trite that sounds, but that's something I always longed for. And my family doesn't look like every other family. I wasn't sure always that that was something that could happen for us. And I know there are many families that do look like other families who struggle. Because wanting to be a mother isn't as easy as saying, I want to be a mother, and then a child magically appears full grown who's well behaved and does whatever you say. (laughs) That's not a thing that happens to anyone. (laughs) I'm sure many mothers would love it. (laughs) But I have found in my journey to become a mother that God can do impossible things, seemingly impossible things. If I had to make a Mother's Day proclamation, I do long for peace for sure, like Julia Warren Howe, but that would be my proclamation. God can do more than we can ask for or imagine. And I know that because God did it for me three times. I know that it might sound complicated to believe that we could all be one in Christ, that we could know God's peace. I know that it is complicated to to celebrate Mother's Day. But I also know that God is with us and that Christ's last prayer to God 